And before I introduce or hand it off to Luis, I'm just gonna read a little bit about uh, our artist. Uh, Luis Manuel Diaz is a visual artist working with photography, drawing from personal and communal history. His practice investigates notions of home, citizenship and care. Diaz holds a BFA in photography from Parsons School of Design and has been awarded the Magnum Foundation US Dispatches Grant and the Enfoco Photography Fellowship. He has exhibited work at Aperture Foundation, Bronx Art Space, Arnold and Sheila Aronson Gallery, and Baxter St. Camera Com Club, among others. He's been published by The Nation, The New Yorker, The California Sunday, Boom, Hoya, ID, Musee, and Faux Magazine, among many others. Diaz currently lives and works between Westchester, New York, and Stamford, Connecticut. And this is just a quick view for folks who are not local um, of some of the works in the current exhi exhibition here at Blue Sky. Um, and yeah, without further ado, I will pass it over to Luis. I'll stop my share and then Luis, feel free to uh, put up your presentation. Thanks. And you're muted at the moment, looks like. Uh -oh. Can you guys hear me? All good? Great. Okay. All right. Thank you guys for joining me. Um, very, I'm very excited to be talking to all of you. Um, very big thank you to Blue Sky, to C, to Molly, um, the staff, everyone that made this possible. Um, it's my very first solo show, so, you know. Wow. Exciting stuff happening. Uh, um, so before, I, I always like contextualizing my work um, by talking a little bit about myself. I mean, it's obvious that all this work is about me and my family. And I always like to say that um, the work is always evolving especially this body of work, there is no such thing for me as a finished body of work. It's, it's an evolution, it's ever, it's ever growing. So my feelings about this work could potentially change in the future. So nothing is really concrete, which I don't know, it adds a little mystery to the work. Um, but um, I would like to Kind of talk about my upbringing because a lot of that informs the work itself. I was born and raised in Mexico, in Michoacan, Mexico, and um, I immigrated to the United States um, when I was nine years old. Uh, this, my great, I, my family, my father would live in the States and I would be, my, my siblings and my mom would be in Mexico and my dad would go periodically. But again, in 2005, uh, we had like this reunification that happened with the family. And that kind of changed a lot of things. It kind of opened this new possibility as to how, even at nine years old, how I viewed myself and like my possibilities. Um, in this migration that was happening, when I immigrated to the States, I quickly realized um, I, like I unconsciously started picking up on a lot of systems that were in place and what it meant to assimilate. And I, along with many other young immigrants that come to immigrate to the United States, it was really easy for me to assimilate. And in order to assimilate, you kind of become blind or, or choose to kind of ignore a lot of your cultural and familiar upbringings. And for me, that kind of created distance between myself, my family, my culture. Um, it wasn't until later in high school when I came 
to photography. I took a class in photography and I think that ended up allowing me to kind of re reapproach on reapproach visualization and I think I think it kind of um, allowed me to look at my family at a, uh, through a different lens. Um, it was when I started learning about assimilation and kind of like the, the problems behind assimilation and what that ends up costing, kind of your relationship with your family and even with yourself. So I kind of began this journey, uh, I kind of began a journey on trying to kind of like reconnect with my family and my culture and kind of my upbringing. And then I, I went to undergrad and then Trump was elected. And I think that was a big shocking thing that shook a lot of different communities. And for me, it was something that I knew a lot of what he, a lot of his rhetoric already existed in the country, but it, I didn't know it was this loud. And for me, that's when I, it, that really shocked me. And I immediately started to wanting to protect and wanting to uh, kind of like create, kind of like counter these narratives that were being um, talked about and kind of like, even though they were false, they were still being talked about and talked about. And a lot of the, then in those conversations, I started thinking about visualization behind immigration. And for me, a lot of visualization regarding immigrants was either criminalized or victimized. There wasn't really much humanity in kind of the images of immigrants and their families. So at this time, my work, really early work, I kind of started thinking about this work is, is not being shown. This is just, it's the process of getting to my work, just FYI. So this work kind of was like a, my very first attempt of trying to create work about family, immigration, uh, citizenship, and all these things that immigrants go through. But I slowly kind of, I became aware of my privilege as in like a light-skinned uh, citizen, a person with documents, and going and talking to these families who had mixed citizenship, uh, mixed status uh, family members. And although I had their consent to make these images, um, I kind of saw the problem behind documentary photography. And I think that's what guided me to make work with my family is recognizing the the problems with the history of photography and documentary photography of just doing, going into communities. And even, even I that had a good understanding of my community, there was still a, a um, power imbalance happening. And now going back at it, I feel that I would approach it a little differently, but I didn't feel comfortable letting these images exist in the internet without having the people in them completely understand what these spaces, like what are the spaces that these are gonna be entered on. And especially this is also the time when there was a big conversation surrounding, um, what was it? Like facial recognition. And when they found out that Facebook had worked with ICE um, in facial recognition to crack down on undocumented immigrants. So for me, it kind of came um, to a shock and kind of like intimidating pursuing um, um, other families and working with people that I didn't necessarily um, have a close relationship with. Um, and to me, this kind of led me to search for what I already had, which was with my family. And what's really interesting at the time is that when I was shooting these projects, I would go and collaborate. I would test, I would do test shoots with my own family before going into their homes. 
because I wanted to have all these really technical things down before going into their homes. And it ended up being better for me and my practice to just think about my family and shoot my family. And throughout this, I kept looking at, before I started diving in, big influence became, was a big influence was uh, Latoya Ruby Frazier, Dina Lawson and Laura Aguilar. Just thinking about the complexity of family community and how we, um, how we present ourselves, how people represent um, a larger community that's often misrepresented. But then also something really interesting to me about this work is like how the mundane and the, and the historical were so beautifully combined that I think um, people were connecting to even necessarily I might have not have a my lived experience might not be similar to someone like Latoya Ruby Frazier, but the way she talks about systems, lineage, and um, futurity, it's really similar to how I view photography. So for me, um, I started thinking, th this picture is really funny, just side story. This was one of my first, one of my early large format images that I made. And this was kind of in response to Trump's like build that wall. And it's really funny, well, at least to me, that it's like, it's, it's supposed to represent getting over the wall. Like we're here, we're over it. We will find ways to get over it. Just like how useless uh, these quote unquote walls are. Um, but this was kind of like the first initial and kind of like important image most important image that I had made at the time that kind of ended up informing um, future, future images. Hey, Luis, sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm not seeing the pictures and I don't think we are as anyone else having, um, I just see your oh, intro no. on, yeah. <laughs> okay, let me try this again. Sorry, guys. No worries, there uh, we go. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Oh. You were just you were just talking about how we're we've been doing Zoom for so long yet we're still like you yeah know, not whizzes at it so <laughs> absolute forgiveness but yeah all right are, are you looking at the image change now um, I'm seeing yeah. one image one image yeah. okay. let's oh wait let's see. Okay, guys, give me one second because Zoom can be hard. Mm -hmm. Tell me Zoom paused. Yeah, I'm not sure. I have a, right now it's a Deanna Lawson. Lawson. You've got seven, slide seven of 36. Maybe if you're able to just slide in without going full screen and just do it this way. Yeah, um, we can do that. That might be better. Yeah, since, we're, since I don't know, Zoom's being a little funky. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. All right. So um, yeah, th these were the initial images that I was talking about where I was going to kind of the um, mixed status families. And it was completely a different approach where it, it followed um, really tradi traditional way of making portraits where you show up, subject, shoot type of thing with some text and kind of just moving away from that. And again, influences uh, Latoya Ruby Frazier, Dina Lawson, Laura Aguilar, 
three, three very, very important artists for my practice. Um, this was the image I was referencing, a big uh, F you to Trump and his build the wall rhetoric. Um, so to me, at the time, I, I kept thinking about landscapes. Uh, I initially started looking at landscapes and the labor behind the upkeeping of America. To me, I've talked about America and how America to me is just one large construction site where there's things being built, things being torn down, but we like beautiful things existing in the world, but never really talking about who are the people making these things and the labor behind it. Um, my father, who was a construction worker at the time, uh, this was one of the sites that he was working on. And it was a building that had and within the past 20 years, he had helped build, but it was torn down to make a new one, which was really, to me, really representative of like this cycle with immigrants where kind of their labor and not only their labor, but their bodies are taken for granted. They end up becoming um, bodies for hire where they're, they, they're not being looked at as necessarily as people, but like the labor that they are providing and just the exploitation that goes along with um, these forms of manual labor. My brother recently decided to, he, he also became a construction worker. And I started thinking about the, again, the cyclical way of uh, America looking at labor and not, don't get me wrong, construction, great way, pays really well, um, but just um, the way that immigrants are viewed within these um, uh, systems of labor. Um, and kind of thinking about cyclical where my father recently, uh, not recently, a few years ago, had a work-related injury and he had to leave his job. But within a year, my brother went in and kind of like one leaving, but one entering in kind of like this never ending cycle of, of labor and the upkeeping of America. Um, so to me, I like to make correlations between um, still lives and bodies. So to me, this was really representative of um, an arm resting. Um, my mother is also a, a, a housekeeper. I was able to go into one of the houses that she cleans and um, I made this portrait. She goes and cleans sometimes four to five houses a day. And it's interesting to me that at the time I, she kept going and cleaning homes but being too exhausted to kind of like really go and clean our own home so it was really up to us to upkeep the home um so at this time i kind of started really differently than a lot of other artists do where like i started really broad with like landscapes and kind of like the public view of immigration and migrant families, and then going more insular to not going into the home. Um, this is where I'll briefly talk about kind of my practice and the way I make images. So a lot of these images are made with a large format camera, a four by five. Um, to me, photography is, it's an excuse to get to know people and get to reconnect with people. And that's why I feel that it was the perfect tool to kind of reconnect with my family, to start going in and um, looking at them through uh, literally a different lens. Um, but there's something so kind of beautiful about looking at your home and looking at your family through a ground glass where they aren't necessarily looking at your face and how you are um what you're what you're looking at but kind of that beauty of putting your uh, grain focuser through the ground glass and kind of focusing on like their face and the focusing and kind of like noticing these really new things about um 
like I remember when I made this portrait of my mother, I remember looking at her eyes and starting to notice the wrinkles in her face. And it was something I hadn't really noticed before. And th that's the kind of the hard thing about making work about your family. Some people think it's really easy, but I just think that they haven't shot their family before because it is hard. But kind of like being able to separate yourself from your family and look at it objectively and be critical and kind of come to this realization that of mortality, which is was really new to me and is still really new to me um, about my parents and their mortality. Um, especially that um, when they worked their whole lives and they've been the strongest, hardest working people, like you hadn't really seen flaws in them, but kind of like through this process, you kind of begin and pick up on um, kind of a more personal and intimate things. Um, I kind of began to look at the domestic space and domesticity and how how time progresses, but things remain the same um, within not only systems, but then like family-wise. Um, this, this image, I ended up taking the, the day of the inauguration when Joe Biden was sworn in, but it's a very, to me, it's a very casual image, um, at least with like my, my father and my younger sister, they're just going about their day and just like this inauguration is happening. And it kind of, it's supposed to bring up the conversation about the politicization of migrants. And especially during when politics are being, when elections and any form of politics are involved, we are kind of used as like this um, talking point where we are made these promises and, um, we're made, made all these promises just for, you know, a party coming in, making choices that will harm, but not really help. And doesn't really matter which party it is. Um, and I slowly started to think about um, this project and how and what I wanted to represent and talked about where I wanted to talk about the nuances of the everyday life and how um, signifiers and how representative um, images and objects became. Um, I started thinking about my, my little sister who is the only American born out of our family, um, what her relationship to um, Mexico is and what her how, what America, because she technically is the only American, wh what's the difference between her American, my American, and my Mexicanness versus her Mexicanness? Um, and just this picture to me, I think it's, um, again, I like to bring in like humor into it and just this horse, this horse, like I grew up, and I guess that you just, it's, it's really like a very personal thing, but like I grew up riding horses and this is the best thing she could do right now is riding this like make-believe horse. Um, so through this, this practice of just going around and making these images, I kind of begin to question um, what the American dream is and kind of how like the systems in place and kind of the imbalance that exists when talking about these things. Um, I came across this image in late 2018. It's an image that was sent to my grandfather, who I found out was uh, part of the Bracero program, which back in the 40s, 50s, and early 60s, the US um, would uh, outsource labor from Mexico and would bring in um, migrant, seasonal migrants to work um, uh, fields in um, the Southwest. Um, this image was really interesting to me because it's of my, it's my mom holding this image 
and it basically says for my father from your kids and they list all the kids um but it's like the only physical um thing that my grandfather has from that time and it really brought me to question um the american dream and the the i guess the different iterations that have existed so my grandfather came to worked for a decade and his american dream was just to come here work go back home and kind of buy property this is before nafta which by the time my father wanted to do the same thing nafta came into play and that reality of going back home and living off the fat of the land type of thing was no longer a possibility um so kind of it begins to um it kind of adds questions about how the American dream has changed for like the working class immigrant through generation and the systems that keep being in place to kind of, to deprive you from kind of um, achieving the American dream. Um, in this, I kind of asked myself and I even asked my parent, my, my, my father and my older brother, what their, iteration of the American dream is my father says that he already made he already achieved his American dream he bought a home all his kids went to college he he's living well my my brother says that he's on his way to achieving the American dream um well he'll soon will hopefully buy property get married have kids and kind of um, have these minor economic differences than the way my dad does where my brother wants to buy this big property. He wants to retire when he's 40, all these different things that weren't necessarily a possibility for my dad, but, you know, it's about progression and, uh, upward mobility. And for me, I kind of, I don't know what um, the American dream is because for me, there's no such thing as the American dream. Um, and it's kind of those differences where we agree to disagree with my family. Um, Cause for me, the American dream is, is a, like for many, it's just a system made to um, work, to kind of like take advantage of the labor that you, um, that you provide for corporations and these larger systems in place. Um, so for me, it's important to talk about these systems and these harder things, but I also like to bring in care. Care and the caretaking that exists within a family has become something really, really important for me. Um, just um, think again, going back to representation and kind of images that exist in the world that are, in, um, that are not, representative of how I know my family and how I know other um, families to be. So kind of creating these more tender images were are very important. Kind of this caretaking for one another, the the upkeeping of one's objects, this um, this figurine, uh, this uh, figure of San Martin Caballero, it's a religious iconography of, of St. Martin who was given to my mom by my, it was sent via mail, took forever to get here from Mexico to my mom. Um, he's a patron saint of, what was it? Of kind of like financial prosperity. My grandmother sent this to us maybe within the year after immigrating here. My, I grew up very religious, um, but kind of this, um, it, it became really interesting to me how religion was one of the few constants when you immigrate and kind of pro provided that ease um, when you, you're in a space that you don't, you're not familiar with. Um, it's, it's slowly, I think my work slowly um, kind of progressed to this point where I kind of 
I'm beginning to ask like who's taking care of who. Again, thinking about um, these early conversations surrounding mortality and kind of um, the kids starting to take care of the parents because their bodies are no longer um, sustaining themselves in a way. Um, I begin to think about kind of the relationship between my sister to my parents and how so much of my understanding of my family has to do with understanding my parents' very early struggles. I wonder what that relationship in Cal, like the, how my sister growing up in the States will change how, will, will be her view on immigration and our parents' perseverance, like how that will look like as opposed to how ours has looked like. Um, again, going back to care and self-care, um, something that I've always talked about and try to bring into conversation and encourage other people, if there's anyone uh, watching this, to really um, speak to your parents about what have they done for themselves that's not revolved around manual labor for other people. Um, this became really evident for me, like during COVID, during the first initial shutdowns where my parents weren't going to work, they were just at home. It was really interesting to look at them because they were so used to their bodies being in motion and doing all these different forms of labor that the, that the, that those two, three months where they couldn't go to work, they, they, I tell them that they went crazy because they started doing things around the house. They started, my dad decided he wanted to repaint the, the living room. He wanted to redo the backyard. He, my mom said, it's the time to redo her closet, all these things. And it's really interesting to me to see what self-care means for them because I feel like we've been conditioned to think of self-care as these very um these very specific um these very self-care looks very specific um a very specific way and for my parents just self-care for my siblings self-care could just be spending time with oneself with loved ones um for me I, at this time, and I think throughout my practice, something that I've been trying to kind of uncover and talked about is not only care, but then also begin to have these like conversations surrounding um, masculinity and care for one and the care that happens within a family. Um, this picture, my dad, my dad, even though he's bald, he likes to have these um, bi-weekly haircuts and it's really funny because um, I'm like the designated family interpreter if you know you know it's like an immigrant thing um, but my dad feels really comfortable with me and I get to I get to help him cut his hair and just like this thinking about how my father grew up in rural Mexico and kind of like what he went through in his childhood with, um, and just like the overall culture surrounding machismo. Um, just like how beautiful these really intimate moments are, how, um, how trusting he is of me. Um, my, my grandmother, um, both of my grandmothers had these really big gardens growing up. Um, and my mom, with her mom, was in charge of, of keeping the garden. Um, recently, after again, post COVID and kind of like refinding some of their own interests that kind of um, COVID brought about was that my mom wanted to plant, uh, um, wanted to bring plants into 
our garden. She wanted to uh, yassify it. <laughs> she wanted to uh, bring color, bring um, all these different plants that reminded her of home. I think that without having those conversations, because throughout COVID, I kept um, having these really important conversations um, around the like their bodies and their again their mortality and how um the systems that are in place are are kind of draining them um this this is in the same garden and i i like to kind of correlate that very first image that i that was at the beginning of the presentation of the cage um, with this image, that Im the, uh, the cage image was, I made that image in like 2018, this image I made um, last summer. And I don't know, there's like a beautiful conversation happening between both of these images and kind of how my understanding of America and what America is. That first initial image was a direct reference to kind of, uh, kind of like a folky song in, in, in with like this Mexican artist group that reference uh, the United States as a golden cage, that it's beautiful, but you can't really escape it. Um, but this image to me kind of begins to kind of correlate kind of the, the understanding the limits of, of America, understanding the limits of America and kind of choosing to focus kind of like on yourself and on your family. Um, yeah. Um, I always, whenever someone asks me to talk to them or like a group of students, I always like leaving with questions. To me, images are I, I always say that my images are, are a lot smarter than I am. I feel that I can never really, I never really get to know my images. It takes a very long time for me to fully understand my images. Um, and for me, this image is really, it's relatively really new for me. It's a self portrait um, in my parents' basement where I kind of made this really makeshift studio last year. And to me, it was, this image was really interesting because it was a reference to this image. Um, it's an image of my father, my mother, and my little sister holding my, my father's neutralization certificate, which kind of, it's a pathway to citizenship. And I like to kind of think about these images um, as a diptych um, and just thinking about these are things that I'm currently thinking about that are kind of influencing my practice as I continue to make work where I kind of, I'm asking kind of um, questions about citizenship um, and like, what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to be American? And um, do pieces of paper such as uh, a citizenship certificate doesn't make you a citizen. Um, again, who gets to be a citizen? And something new that I think it's going to complicate this search, and I think it's a very important conversation that I think the community needs to have, is that how does your proximity to whiteness um, come into play when you're an immigrant living in the United States? How does your, your passing in a way help um, with your, um, I guess, longevity in this country? Thank you. Thank you, Louise, so much. I love that you ended that on actually on a question, especially when you began your talk talking about how this is not a finished project necessarily mm -hmm. and that you can see it having a life you know as you create more work um and yeah mm -hmm. i really appreciate you speaking to your um your approach to the project and how it kind of evolved um so thank you so much for your time 
Um, folks can go ahead and add their questions um, into the chat and I'll just go ahead and facilitate that. Um, but uh, I guess one question I had just to kick it off um, with your you know, family's participation, I'm curious um, what dialogue you have with them as you're making the work and then as you've um, finished printing the work and as they've seen work, how that process mm -hmm. for you and your family. Um, that's, that's actually a really great question because um, as I had mentioned that the kind of my very early approach, I had started making work without the intention of making my family the subject matter. They were more like my test subjects. I would test everything with them. And I think when I slowly started speaking to them and kind of talking about my feelings surrounding making images of other people, um, and how I wanted to make images about like my family. They were, they laughed because they're like, what makes you think that we're so interesting? Like, who's gonna wanna see that? Um, but I think like slowly through like being really persistent, I felt that if I wasn't really persistent with them, I think I wouldn't have gotten a lot of the shots that I've had. Um, and my mom likes to, and I had this really, this, um, trade that happens when I make images because there's there's a lot of like labor that goes on to making these images and they, they're as the projects progress they're like okay I know you want to make this image and it's going to take me time because you know oh we lost your audio a little bit I think when you hit your um headphone <laughs> Can you hear me? There you are. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, beautiful. Um, what's really interesting uh, with shooting large format is they, they understand that it's gonna take anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes to make one or two exposures. So they like to do these trades where I have to do something for them so they can sit down and um, and let me take their pictures. So through time, they kind of like begin to um, taking their time more seriously, as they like to say. And um, but yeah, they've they've been very supportive of. I've I've been very lucky because they've been very supportive of so much of what I've done. And I think that through time and kind of them seeing the the physical work i remember i had, when in my undergrad i made a photo book and it was like a, just a collection of i want to say like close to 80 images of just my family i think that it really hit them and they kind of begin to understand what i was trying to say and kind of the importance of the work um yeah i've, I've been just really fortunate with how um into it, they've gotten it. Sorry, now I'm muted. Um, thank you, Luis. <laughs> um, uh, do they ever ask you for prints for their for for them to keep? Yeah, it's it's. I, I always make these little test prints, and I always like to show them. My mom likes to keep them on like uh, the fridge. And just recently, I found that she had framed this really early self-portrait that I had made and she had framed it and put it in her room and it's literally like the worst self-portrait um but she 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 ends up keeping so many of those images that it's it's always really interesting to me what she ends up liking because to me I apply so much meaning to very specific images and it's really interesting to me to see what images she and my little sister and my dad, like the images that they find important. Thank you. Um, so we had a similar question by Ryan in the chat and I'm mm -hmm. wondering Ryan, if you had any other follow-up questions to that since we overlapped on question, um, but feel free to put it in the chat. Um, yeah, and if anyone has any other questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, 
And um, while folks are doing that, my other my other thing I was wondering is that you are the photographer in this project, but you're also a sitter yourself and was curious about your thought process of enter entering your own self into the project visually, as well as being the person behind the camera. Mm -hmm. Add, um, I, again, really great question. I was really hesitant at first with not only I find myself to be really awkward in front of the camera, obviously, but um, I don't know, there were, I found it important later on because I didn't realize in the beginning of how much of me was in these images. And it kind of started slow where I would kind of make references to me being behind the camera, whereas through a shadow, um, that's coming forth or keeping in at the bottom frame. But I think that when I had these harder images to make in these really specific ways of, these very specific ways in which I looked at my work, I, I had no option but to kind of like put myself in the, in the frame because there were very specific things that I wanted to talk about. Like that image, that image, that last image that I left with, where it's like a self-portrait with the white cloth, it's a very specific thing that I'm, that I'm going through. I'm asking these questions about uh, like your proxy to whiteness, kind of like the, the citizenship and what that means. These are very specific things that I'm asking myself. And I think that if I would have put someone else in that wasn't me, I think um, it wouldn't, not that images have to be like authentic and true because you know, what is true in photography, but I think there, it's a more, it was a more honest way of making and talking about things because these are very specific things to me that I think my family necessarily right now, they're not, um, not understanding, but they're not um, um, grasping on or um, interested in right now. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And I think that it really adds a lot having you in there and the self-portraits intermixed mm -hmm. with the landscapes and the portraiture of your family. I think it makes it a really dynamic project in that way. Um, Chris Rauschenberg is asking, um, kind of go, to go back to your fam other question earlier about family, how would you characterize the images that your family likes? Oh, that, that's, uh, it's funny because um, my family tends to like, I kind of show them like, um, I sometimes show them contact sheets and they like images where people are smiling. Like I always, whenever I make images, I make one, like, especially when I take some of my little sister, I take one smiling and one not. Um, I don't know, it's just shooting, shooting little kids smiling is, it's really easy, but I think when you're presenting the work, the cuteness gets in the way sometimes. I don't know if that makes sense for some people, but I don't know, for me, a lot of my work is about kind of like reclamation of body and gaze. And for me, kind of like they don't, these, some of these images don't necessarily owe you a happy ending or a, or a, um, a satisfied person in the situation that they're living in. Um, so for me, the images that I'm really interested in is where, where kind of there's this, like a frame that's more, um, um, what, what, is, what is the word, confrontational than necessarily um, passive or um, uh, um, happy. But happiness is also really interesting because we don't see happy images a lot of the times when we talk about um, a lot of these subject matters. Um, but I don't know, it's a really weird thing because then you kind of bring into conversation kind of um, um, family albums and 
these images being presented as a family album and that relationship between making images of your family to a family album. Um, but yeah, my family, just to um, try to answer this, um, they, they tend to go for like the more happy, snapshotty looking images. Um, they, don't, they don't really understand like the image of the paper airplane in the ground with the soap the filming soap, they don't really understand that. And to me, like, that is one of my favorite images that I've made recently, but they don't really care for it. They like more of like these close-up portraits of my siblings or themselves. And as you say, then they can frame them and put them on their bedroom walls. And <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Yu Yang Zhang is asking, uh, well, first, thank you for the talk, Luis. I'm curious about your choice of black and white photography. They are tender, but also could suggest something colorless. I'm curious about the thought process of this choice. And um, so that's the first question. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just read the whole thing. Another question regards to the photo of your mom. It looks like she was holding a remote trigger. If that's mm -hmm. true, would you please talk about the choice of that? If not, ignore, <laughs> if not, ignore this. Thank you. No, that is, thank you. That is such a great question. Um, well, to talk about black and white, I need to talk about kind of the format that I'm using, black and white, and kind of this really, this, this work kind of started with kind of like playing around with a large format camera in black and white, but then eventually I kind of started reading theory and kind of like understanding the power behind and kind of the history behind large format and kind of beginning to understand photo history and, and the way that this view camera has been used historically. Um, and just thinking about how this same exact tool, the same exact format, black and white, just the different ways that it's been used to kind of make portraits of uh, different communities. So in a way, I'm kind of like reclaiming the, the tool, reclaiming the format, um, but I like how what black and white does to images. It's kind of like an outlier because historically tr there's nothing truer than like a black and white image because, you know, it's tied to documentary photography and, you know, Roy de Carava, Jacob Rees, all these great documentary photographers. But black and white, I think, hides also. So for me, I, I like black and white because of the historical reference that it makes, but then it also, it's kind of a window. It kind of like um, allows you to kind of create at least one layer of separation where you're kind of separating yourself and not necessarily allowing people to view specific things. Um, so it's, for me, it's a way to hide things. I, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but um, it's um, a tool that I keep thinking about and, and I'm still trying to understand just how black and white um, operates. But for now, I like to say that it helps me hide things. It helps me um, um, create a physical, layer kind of this depriving of uh, color and some information um, and to kind of circle to back to the idea of um, to go back to the question about the self-portrait that was yeah that was a shutter release and it was um, my mom was taking a self-portrait uh, that was an early self-portrait that she did because um, she used to claim that claimed that I would take the worst pictures of her she's like that she wished she she could know when I would press the shutter release. So one day I ended up giving it to her where I would go set up the image and just give her the shutter release. Um, and in a way, those early um, conversations about authorship of images with them, because like I would give them the shutter release, so I would allow them to take images. Also that picture with my father and my brother, the love sea picture of the three of us sitting down, my dad is the one pressing the shutter release. Um, cause I would kind of give them, cause I, I felt that they, at the time that they were feeling like they were just being subjects, that they weren't being collaborators. And 
even though it can seem a little empty handed, I would give them the, the shutter release. Um, although we would have these conversations about the image and what I want the images to talk about. Um, I think giving them the shutter release kind of allowed them to be more open about creating these images and be more involved in the making of them too. Yeah, I love that. I, I wondered if that was the case in the picture of you with your dad giving him the haircut because mm -hmm. his gaze was so intent and direct that it made me wonder if he was the one that had the kind of like, okay, yeah. here it is. Yeah. yeah, it's it's really funny because sometimes I give it to them and they post themselves. They're, they're like ready, but I'm like kind of like at an awkward position. I'm still like trying to position myself for the image. And we do multiple exposures of every, every one, but I find myself that I end up liking them more when I'm not quote unquote ready for them. Like again, sorry to go back to this image, but the one of my brother and my dad, I was trying to adjust myself between them. I was kind of like shimmying myself in. And I think getting me at that position, because like I was like uncomfortably trying to squeeze in, that's what made the image work for me. Um, was one of the things that made it work for me because it's about that trying to be in this space with them, like so close together and kind of the awkwardness of that made it work. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. And a, a follow-up follow question to that um, regarding your idea of focusing on the idea of, uh, quote, what does it mean to be a citizen, unquote. Are you going to approach that through the same familial lens or are you going mm. to go for a broader or more investigating approach? That's, I'm still trying to, um, I'm like studying that a little bit more and thinking more broadly. I think I might bring in my family for that, but then I think I'm gonna start opening it um, and go through my community or all these other communities that I'm a part of. Um, because I think citizenship is more than, uh, I think, immigration status. Citizenship is being uh, protected, being seen, being heard. Um, there was this really great talk with, um, with Zora Murph where he talks about um, citizenship and the, when we, during, the 2020 summer, the Black Lives Matter um, protests, all those protests were arguably about citizenship. Because again, going back to who really gets to be a citizen is cis, het, able-bodied white men. Those are the citizens of this country. No one else can really benefit from being a citizen here. Um, so again, to, to answer your question, I think um, I would like to kind of look at myself, look at my family, but then also look at my community that I'm, or the different communities that I'm a part of and seeing what citizenship means to them and what America and the correlation to America. Yeah, thank you. And thanks you, Young, for those, those great questions. Um, and then one last question that just came in um, from Kristen Blalock. What has been the reaction or response of your community to your photo photos? It's, I love talking about this. Um, I've had the opportunity, I've been able to show some work locally and even online. And I don't know, it's really rewarding to like have institutions or these um, kind of like academic spaces show your work and show like appreciation for your work and see the value of your work. But I think there's nothing more rewarding than having someone tell you that they get it, like that they understand the work at like at an emotional labor, the, at an emotional level. Um, I remember showing this to like a group of high schoolers and, and just hearing them talk about the images and hearing them go on and 
talk about exactly what the images are about and their own personal relationship to their family immigration and um, these other things that come about when being an immigrant family. I think that's when you know you're making um, work that's being understood by your community, which I think it's the point for me to make work that's um, um, understand and I think um, that kind of talks about, even though it's such a very specific familial, it's through a very specific familial lens that is still um, accessible for other people and that other people can relate to it. Yeah, just having other people show appreciation and completely understand um, kind of the nuances that, that go on into um, an immigrant family. And I think the trying to stay connected and straight trying to stay familial with your family. Thanks, Luis. And thanks everyone for your questions. I think we'll wrap it up at this point as it's a little after one o'clock, but um, I so appreciate your time today and putting together this great presentation. And if you are local or able to come to Portland, please come to Blue Sky and check out Luis's amazing exhibition. Again, it is uh, on view until July 2nd. Um, and if any other questions for Luis, feel free to contact us at Blue Sky and I'm, I'm happy to relay those questions directly to Luis or you can contact Luis probably through uh, his website. And thanks yeah. everyone. Thank you so much guys. Thank you. Thank you to Blue Sky. Thank you for all of you for, sh for showing up. Um, really appreciate you all. Hope you guys have a great day.